Hi, everyone. I'm Levi Brambaum, Curatorial Assistant for Collections here at the Guggenheim. And I'm very excited to welcome you to the first iteration of Artwork Anthology, the Guggenheim's online series exploring the stories behind artworks in the museum's collection, and a place where curators can share personal perspectives about some of the Guggenheim's most iconic works. For those interested in learning more about the images that I'm gonna to show today, uh, there's an image caption list uh, in the video description that is there for your reference. And at the end of my presentation, I'll be taking a few questions. So please feel free to use the chat box to submit any questions or comments that come up. Today, I'll be speaking about a work by Robert Mablethorpe, a leading American photographer of the 20th century. Last year, I assisted a curatorial team consisting of associate curators Lauren Hinkson and Susan Thompson in organizing Implicit Tensions Maplethorpe Now, an exhibition which considered the polarizing debates that unfolded around Maplethorpe's provocative images of gay S&M practices, as well as his homoerotic depictions of Black men during the culture wars of the late 1980s and early 90s. Together, we placed these debates alongside Maplethorpe's work as an invaluable touch point for ensuing generations of photographers. One proposition that this exhibition made and which I continue to think about is the importance of measuring an artist's legacy beyond frameworks of formal achievement and beyond radical breaks from tradition. An artistic legacy is equally about the ways that artworks hold stories that are bigger than the artists that made them, stories of the world that brought the work into being and stories of a world that's being built by artists and by viewers today. It's with this in mind that I want to revisit a work that we featured in the exhibition, Embrace, a silver gelatin print that's about 20 by 16 inches. The photograph features two men dressed and undressed nearly identically, absorbed in a passionate hug. Across their shared poses, chests pressed together, faces buried in one another's shoulders, Maplethorpe draws great attention to their racial difference using the stark binaries of black and white value to render an affecting image of interracial connection. Rather than considering this image within Maplethorpe's body of work alone, I think that Embrace would benefit from being rethought, instead as a translation of one of the most enduring tropes of American cooperation from the 20th century, the black and white handshake. To be clear in this talk, I'm not gonna be making an art historical argument about Maplethorpe's intention by suggesting that he consciously planned to remake this symbol. I'm actually proposing something slightly different, that if we accept how fundamentally the imagery and embrace never belong to Maplethorpe, we're actually in a better position to appreciate what his photograph is doing. Embrace, from my perspective, is one striking recurrence of a pervasive trope part of a continuous unfolding of civil rights movement activism in our collective imagination. I'm gonna start this story with a button featuring a logo used by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee or the SNCC, a group founded in 1960 to help amplify the perspectives of young black organizers within the civil rights movement. The SNCC's student-led nonviolent direct action campaigns worked in its early years in close cooperation with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s Southern Christian Leadership Conference, playing a major role in realizing landmark state and federal safeguards for fundamental civil rights, including African-American voting rights and legal mandates to honor the integration of public transportation, of public schools, and of the workforce. The SNCC strategic visual communication across its book photos, its posters, its bulletins, and its buttons were central tools in its message of democratic change. And though there are much earlier starting points for this imagery of joining hands in American culture, I'm beginning today from the SNCC button because it has a rich political history, a widespread visual circulation, and it captures the feeling, the embodied feeling, I think, of early 1960s civil rights activism. In her extraordinary scholarship about SNCC photography, Lee Rayford explains in her words that the repeated use of SNCC's images have turned them into icons, icons which help us construct our collective history. This is certainly true of SNCC buttons as well. 
For example, high school students who wore these buttons to school defended their rights in court, creating constitutional precedents for future rulings protecting student political speech. Memoirs of SNCC activists variously recall this button with joined hands as a helpful visual code in the field, an easy way to identify other group members. And this button, along with other black white visual designs from the SNCC has become historical shorthand of a sort, a way to invoke the founding period of the organization in which white students as well as black students played a major role in organizing. This is before the SNCC's embrace of a more radical politics um, of black liberation and of self-determination in the mid 1960s, marked visually, for example, by the use of a raised fist signifying black power. This earlier logo expresses both the optimism and the ensuing tensions of an interracial model of civil rights organizing. And it's this early logo's development, which I'm gonna trace here in a bit more depth. Many different versions of this button circulated in the first years of the SNCC's existence. These versions reveal certain patterns about the kinds of connection implied by joining hands, patterns which we might otherwise take for granted, such as the fact that in most images, the hand of the black participant is foregrounded, or that the hands, always tightly clasping, are identically sized, or that the arms do not bend at the wrist, but instead extend out of the image's frame so that the joined hands become like a link in a strong straight line. SNCC documents which mention these buttons identify this image not as a handshake with its connotations of polite decorum, but rather as a crossed hands emblem, emphasizing its spirit of solidarity. The button in the lower right corner for the March on Washington was a reframing of SNCC logo imagery for a multi-organization milestone assembly on the Washington Mall. This march mustered crucial support for civil rights reform and it's most popularly remembered by Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, a speech that I'm noting here because it significantly invokes the image of joined hands. Let's listen to this moment in Dr. King's speech. Many Americans watched this assembly on their television screens. They not only heard Dr. King's stirring words, but they also saw and felt this image for the very first time, with attendees of every race swaying arm in arm, raising their voices and a rendition of We Shall Overcome. As a collective of thousands of people invented a new image of interracial solidarity, they impressed it with the help of photography and television into the collective consciousness of a generation. For an afternoon, a world was dreamt into being in the image of joined hands. And the thousands of buttons which were distributed and worn and preserved became objects for reflection and reflections themselves of a profound shift in American feeling. A subsequent version of this SNCC clasped hands emblem was stylized so that the black and white hands become fused at their center, reimagined as the yin and yang from Chinese philosophy. This updated logo is at once a stronger distillation of the oppositional structure of America's black white racial paradigm. And it's also a stronger assertion of an aspiration for racial unity with black and white bodies reimagined as forces that are foundationally interconnected. Now, it's this historically particular intensity of connection, this early 60s aspiration for interracial harmony, this early 60s display of bodies holding one another that I can't help but be reminded of when I look at Maplethorpe's photograph, Embrace, made nearly two decades later. Maplethorpe's image, I'd argue, aspires to be as graphic as a political button with its layering of the visual and social binaries of black and white. 
it also aspires to be as iconic with its identically sized anonymous bodies. These anybodies, I should clarify, are explicitly masculine bodies. It's as if the identically sized hands of the SNCC logo and all of its insinuations of peace between men have had their homosocial assumptions here transformed into a homoerotic spectacle. Maplethorpe's photograph also aspires, I think, to be distinctively introspective. While the SNCC image promotes a vision of bodies which break out of their frame, in Embrace, the two men are so fully contained, so physically and emotionally involved, that the image holds tightly to its sense of privacy. Now, rather than contrasting Maplethorpe's introspective art against the world-focused labor of activism, I'm actually interested in thinking about how Maplethorpe's embrace is one example of a decades long widespread shift in American visual culture that's due to civil rights activism, a shift in which the logics of art and activism thoroughly permeate one another, together reimagining the shape of the American subject. Here I mean the shape of the American subject quite literally. If we look at the portrait vocabularies which develop after the civil rights movement, Maplethorpe's photograph offers a fascinating moment in which inside the portrait frame, usually reserved for one body, we instead see the fusion of two different racialized halves. We see this also in the 1960s photographic experiments of Richard Avedon and James Baldwin, in the 1970s self-portraiture of T.C. Cannon, in the early paintings of Faith Ringgold, as well as in the satirical allegories of Robert Colescott, vastly different practices, which are but a handful of examples of a wide trend in American art in which the individual post-civil rights body is imagined by artists as multiple bodies, irrevocably linked by the dissonance of America's racial inheritance. As I've spent more time with Maplethorpe's work, especially because he is a photographer that took so many self-portraits, I have developed a strangely personal knowledge of his body. I'm familiar with the muscle tone of his arms and the dusting of freckles on his shoulders, with the size and shape of his hands, as well as the intricate parting of his hair. And the anonymous place occupied by this white body, I can easily imagine Maplethorpe's. And I wonder if Embrace might qualify as an example of Maplethorpe's self-portraiture too. Now, I can't say so with certainty, but I can say that part of what is motivating my conjecture is that Maplethorpe had a particular knack for situating his images and situating his desires in relation to the transgression and unification of binaries, especially those of black and white. The thing is, it's not only the queer rebelliousness of the 70s and the 80s that is the source of the transgression and embrace. I like to think that it may just as well be the hopefulness and the wholesomeness of the civil rights movement of the early 1960s in images which have impressed themselves indelibly into the mind of a teenage Maplethorpe. Such a predisposition to internalize the images around oneself and an ability to store and develop and reprocess them for decades to come also offers another way of thinking about photographic innovation and photographic invention. In June and July of 2020, which is where I'm speaking as I think about this photograph, images of clasped hands appear on Instagram feeds and Facebook pages appended to company logos in statements of solidarity with courageous protests challenging America's persisting anti-Blackness and police brutality. Protests which are demanding thorough systemic change. One of my favorite interpretations of this trend is a meme made by Joy Oladokun, a wonderful singer with a new album that you should definitely go and check out after this video. Let's listen for a moment to Joy's commentary. Graphic design is the cure to racism. Graphic design, it will make the world fair. Here's a white hand and a black hand and we put them together. Graphic design, hey, look over there. This video ends with a singing corporation that, quote, goes back to enacting policies to oppress everybody, end quote. 
It perfectly captures for me how the clasped hands emblem when repurposed by corporate America amidst this period of mourning and this period of collective reckoning is hollow and distracting. One of the reasons why I identify with this critique is also because I feel strongly, though perhaps naively, that the empty gestures of corporations cannot ever fully appropriate or abstract or reduce the power of activist images. That the civil rights movement that these images help us remember continues to shape and reshape our post-civil rights world in profound ways. One way to look for this in art, I think, is to resist treating artwork as a final fully realized end in itself, whether it be Maplethorpe's or otherwise, and instead to attend to the constantly changing work of the image. Such images like the clasped hands emblem are part of our collective inheritance. And as we accept, reproduce, reinterpret, and as necessary, reject them, we embrace history too by remaking it as our own. Thank you all so much for listening. We have time for a few questions. So let me just see what has been logged in the chat box. So it looks like the first question is about activism. Um, there's a listener who is asking how um, Maplethorpe's work might connect to other activist movements. And I think that um, with Embrace, visually, there's a really strong through line that you could draw with queer activism um, in the reminder of the power of kissins. Um, kissins are protests of same gender couples uh, kissing, which emerged in the 70s as a way of challenging the uneven application of public indecency laws. They highlighted how even the most basic forms of queer intimacy, like hugging and kissing, were subject to policing. And those strategies of using queer intimacy to raise awareness uh, about the abuse of queer life have remained important to generations of queer activists um, through Maplethorpe's time, through the AIDS crisis and beyond. I think that it's very safe to say that Maplethorpe understood the high stakes of expressing queer intimacy, of expressing interracial intimacy. Um, and he also understood how to present the innocuous um, as a means of entertaining and rerouting other people's perceptions of what is salacious. And I think that his work is animated by all of these sort of public stakes. Um, our next question is, can you share any information about correlations or contrasts between visual art photography and photojournalist photography in relation to protest imagery? So as it pertains to Maplethorpe's embrace, I've been trying to highlight this very big and very productive overlap that exists between different photographic genres to speak about the ways that certain images which purport to belong to the world of visual art very much draw from popular images of protest and more widely from documentary photography traditions. I think that it's really important to acknowledge that there is a, a very two-way relationship between art and documentary photography. Um, it's evidenced by the amount of photographers that have documentary practices and studio practices. Um, but I also think that there's a bigger question about visual art that isn't just photographic specific. I think that in the last few decades, other mediums, um, in particular, um, in particular, painting, right, have really um, recruited photography um, to do a, a slow and careful thinking about the power of protest imagery. Um, so I would say that there are really, really fascinating um, overlaps between visual art photography and photojournalism that have been plumbed not only in photography but even beyond. Um, we have time for one more question, which is, how do you see Maplethorpe's work connecting to the period of the 1980s in which it was made? I love this question. Um, there is a lot that is awesomely 80s about this image, denim and all. Um, but I'm really happy that, this, that uh, you asked this because I've been thinking about how this image actually might participate or anticipate um, the patriotic spirit of 80s America, of a Reagan era America. It's really all about reaching across difference in the name of building 
American unity. Um, it, it was it was a sort of feeling that that swept pop culture in the 80s. Um, in relationship to embrace, I'm thinking about it because of charity projects like Hands Across America, um, a transcontinental human chain of American hands that uh, are brought together in the name of eradicating poverty. Um, something about the zeitgeist of that time feels like it's in an image like Embrace. And I also have been thinking about that because critiques and reclamations of that time, um, like we, we saw recently in a film like Jordan Peele's Us, I think that those are also relevant to the politics of Maplethorpe's image as well as its political limits, its very real limits. Um, so thank you for that question. And thank you all for tuning in. I hope you have a great day.